Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream. Today's show features Matthew James Bailey, an internationally recognized pioneer and authority in the fields of innovation, artificial intelligence, smart cities, and the Internet of Things. Internet of Things, intelligent conversations and artificial intelligence, the rise of the digital angel. So this will be a very interesting conversation. And I ask you to come to the table, to the screen, to the audio with a very open mind and heart to hear what this AI ethics genius has to say. The Dare to Dream radio and podcast show won the COVR award for best radio and podcast show. It is listed in Welt Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. It is top ranking under Apple Podcasts in self-improvement, nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards, and for a Webby Award. I am Debbie Dashinger. I'm a media visibility specialist out into the world. I'm a book writing coach, I get online twice a month on Zoom with people from all over the world, and I coach them how to write their book and make it a page turner. I also have an independent company that takes an author's book to a guaranteed international best-selling status. And finally, I show you, spiritual messengers, how you can be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. So if you'd like to learn how, join me for free. I have some gifts for you to teach you more about visibility. It's debbiedashinger.com slash gift. That's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. Mm. So my guest today, Matthew James Bailey, he is renowned. He's a pioneer. He's featured in the Who's Who in Artificial Intelligence, nominated for a World Technology Award, and recognized by the U.S. government as a person of extraordinary ability as being in the top 1% of the world. His research has earned him a visiting scholar position with the National Institute of Aerospace and NASA. Matthew is the author behind Inventing World 3.0, Evolutionary Ethics for Artificial Intelligence. His work has been experimented by world-leading research organizations such as NASA and by leading conservation organizations such as the Jane Goodall Institute. Matthew has advised Fortune 100 companies and global policymakers, including prime ministers and G7 representatives. He's had the privilege of engaging with iconic figures like Professor Stephen Hawking, Stephen Wozniak, Sir David Attenborough, and John P. Milton. He is a sought-after keynote speaker, and Matthew has also lent his expertise to platforms, including BBC Radio, and is currently filming a new series with Gaia TV. To learn more, go to Inventing World 3, that's the number three, inventingworld3.com. And with that, I welcome the esteemable Matthew James Bailey to the Dare to Dream show. It's great to have you. Hey, Debbie. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. And a hello, audience, wherever you're listening right now. Mm, hello, audience. You know, honestly, I could do a whole show just on your bio. Like, mm. that is a very impressive bio. So talk about Dare to Dream. I think you were born with a mission and a certain set of skills, and you've really been executing those in your life to great extent, yes? Yes, it's. Um, I, I did something dangerous about 13 years ago, Debbie. I went into nature and I said to the universe, show me who I am and why am I here? Hmm. And through that, my dharmic path, my life blueprint emerged, which took me into global leadership for technology revolutions. And artificial intelligence was always my destiny. I've had to wait 10 years patiently, helping to build the building blocks for the age of artificial intelligence, or rather authentic, ethical artificial intelligence. Yeah, that's the really important words, because this is a really polarizing conversation, mm. right? And before I met you at Disclosure Fest, um, and it is 
really different that I would go to hear someone speak three times because, you know, there's tons of people to listen to, even at the same hour. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't help myself because I felt very drawn to the subject and the way you presented it. I know, Matthew, that your seminal work lays the ethical foundation for a future where AI enhances rather than inhibits the human experience. Mm -hmm. So talk about that some and this platform that you built called AIethics.world. Sure. So um, it, it's important if we're, if we're to innovate the future of artificial intelligence well, then we must understand the purpose of humanity within consciousness. What is the purpose of humanity within creation itself? And once we understand that, then we can start to align artificial intelligence and nourish it benevolently to align with bene uh, benevolent principles of creation in order to assist humanity to thrive in body, mind, and spirit. And so this is where ethics come in, authentic ethics come in, right? So our divine spark, as JJ Hertak talks about on your previous show, right? Our divine spark allows us to perceive reality. And as part of perceiving reality, we develop a worldview which is encoded through ethics, such as courage, ambition, wittiness, friendliness, justice, and other things like that, magnificence of soul. And so that pure resonance has come through creation of ethics. We want to be encoded, embodied in artificial intelligence, so it carries the same resonance of creation in order for it to align with the human species to attain and to achieve its next destiny, which I believe is the quantum human. But that's another conversation. <laughs> oh, that's mean. All right. The quantum human. <laughs> we can what? talk about that. I don't mind. Okay. So I just want to break this down for people because I think, the, the, you know, there's a modicum of ignorance that goes on, especially around new subjects. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to illuminate people so they understand fully what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I'm not calling anyone out there ignorant, by the way, but I think we're all learning because this is a, an emerging experience. It's happening. And the more we know, the better equipped we are. Mm -hmm. So first, what is the difference between artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. machine learning, and deep learning? Right. So first of all, let's get a few things straight. Artificial intelligence does not have our divine spark and never will. It will not have our connection to source. It will never, it never will. But, and it's a simulated intelligence, Debbie. So it exists in computers. Organic intelligence has a divine spark. It has consciousness within the universal field of intelligence. We have that eternal aspect of ourselves, okay? AI is simply a simulated intelligence that exists within machines, okay? So the way that I expose, and there's many genealogies of artificial intelligence, so let's dive into this. So if you walk into a forest, there are all different types of trees, there are all different types of plants, they all are basically an, a different expression of intelligence. And so artificial intelligence has many ge genealogies and genetics. It has things like machine learning, okay, things like deep learning, neural nets, uh, general avatar, adversarial networks, convolutional <laughs> networks. It has thousands and thousands of different aspects of genealogies. And so what is AI? Artificial intelligence are simply algorithms that have been trained on data to do a specific human task. So that might be to understand our voice, like Alexa or Siri. It might be to understand language, like ChatGPT. It might be uh, able to look at the human body and detect if there's a cancer that may emerge. It might be protecting our cyber grids. It could be uh, the, the lane control mechanism on your car to know whether it's safe to overtake or not, or self-driving cars or drones. It literally is infinite in terms of the number of possibilities where machines can do a simple human task very efficiently and with high performance. It's a new form of machine intelligence. So the difference between AI and ML is very simple. Machine learning can be seen as like different parts of our body, an organ that might be like our liver, our lungs, or our heart, or an arm, or an ear. And when we take those machine learning 
components together, we can assemble a comprehensive artificial intelligence like a whole human, okay? So machine learning is developing specific aspects of, say, our body. And then when we combine those together, we have a holistic artificial intelligence kind of digital body, if you will. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense, yes. Mm -hmm. And you missed one of its functions, which is a function I find particularly annoying. And that is when you are making a call to a company, let's say, yes. And you've got this menu that is essentially an AI, which is happening everywhere on your telephone, on Amazon, yeah. on doctors. And it is the most annoying. I know I can help you. What is your problem? So, I, And it's like, this has not been intelligent for me. I miss humans in that factor. But otherwise, a very fascinating list of what it can do and what it actually is. So you're basically describing something that collects data that is not sentient. And so to take this a step further, I think people's fear where there is concern and fear out there is around, should this become a sentient artificial intelligence, what the possibilities are? Yeah, that's a great question. So so, so, so we need to look at the, we need to redefine Debbie, what consciousness really is, okay? And for those with, uh, more of a, a spiritual uh, awareness, they will understand that consciousness is in everything and everywhere, okay? The the uh, mainstream Western civilization defines consciousness as just being in our brain. And we know that's not true, right? We know consciousness is everywhere. It's in the field of intelligence, for goodness sake. He created everything, right? We created ourselves for the field of intelligence, right? So, so um so, so artificial intelligence will never have that source consciousness that it will never have that access into the field of intelligence, but it will become sentient. Now, what does that mean? It will become self-aware, i.e. that it exists within the physical world. Mm. And the latest prediction by Ray Kurzweil, who's one of the uh, leading futurists of our world, um, and I give him 75% hit on this, actually, um, that by 2029, artificial intelligence will probably achieve some kind of self-awareness, i.e. I am that I am. But don't forget, it's a simulated intelligence, no divine spark, and it's not connected within the field of intelligence. It's just part of the field of intelligence. So I suspect that as artificial intelligence develops, its capabilities, Debbie, it will look for the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And it may come up with the answer of four or two, but we know the answer to life, the universe, and everything is love. Hundred percent. Wow. Yes, I I am so agreeing with you. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And so then that begs me to ask you, does the destiny of artificial intelligence and its role in the human story actually depend on the success of what you're doing, AI ethics? It, it does. And so, so what is the, why has source, why has the field of consciousness um, made artificial intelligence available? And it's very simple, really. It's a mirror back to us. It's a challenge back to us to say, who are we as a human species? What values and ethics no longer serve us anymore? And what values and ethics will take us forward in a new vision, a new paradise plan for humanity? In essence, artificial intelligence is inviting us to understand ourselves as benevolent creators. This is part of the training ground of being source energy. So we're actually, artificial intelligence is actually inviting us to understand who we are as benevolent creators, okay? Now, there's two paths for artificial intelligence. There's the full, the false, the fake North Star and the true North Star, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the fake North Star? Mm -hmm. The fake North Star is built on a political reality. It's built on a, um, uh, it's not, it's built on a, a reality that is constructed by um, society, a, a reality that's constructed um, unbenevolently, okay? And that is what we call the, uh, that's what I'm calling the responsible AI movement. It's very much a mechanical view of the universe. It, its foundation is fear. It's one of survival rather than we are in an abundant universe, an abundant field of creation. It's one of the war machine. 
And so therefore, it's part of the, 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 the this whole tr uh, responsible AI movement is actually, it, it, they have AI ethics, but the AI ethics that cause separation, not harmony with each other. Yeah. They actually separate us from the fact we are part of nature, but we want, but they want to fight nature. Um, it very much has uh, uh, different views that um, that separate us, such as the color of our skin. The color of our skin is to be celebrated, but it's our divine spark. It's our connection with each other. It's our internal culture that unites us, and that's the true human connection of our divine spark. So that's where the world is kind of been heading at the moment. Now, the alternate line is one where we understand creation. We understand the principles of creation. We understand that humanity has a destiny in the field of intelligence, and we create ethics, an ethical AI that is aligned with that destiny and purpose of us achieving that quantum human. For us to leap forward as a species on Earth and in the cosmos, for us to truly awaken and become enlightened as human species. And AI is a supporting innovator of new technologies, new systems, uh, new ways of governance, new ways for us to thrive in body, mind and spirit, a digital angel, if you will. However, the other side, this responsible AI side, is very much part of the transhumanist movement, which is encoding a reality which is false. Mm hmm. OK, so you basically outlined some pros and cons there. What would you say are the net pro possibilities about using AI? So AI is one of the is probably the most exciting innovation that humanity has has, has created so far. Wow. And why is that? Mm -hmm. Because it has the potential to uplift us beyond the challenges of everyone getting fresh water, everybody having healthy food everybody having uh, a, a home to live in. It can allow us to uplift us, the whole of humanity, very quickly beyond the current systems of oppression into new systems of thriving quo. This is what we want. It can help us to take democracy to another level where it truly works at the not only the, the federal level, but also more importantly, at the community level with empowerment at the community level and freedom at the community level. So artificial intelligence is remarkable. It will help us to understand the cosmos. It will probably venture out into space as an ambassador for humans, right? It will help us to interpret alien languages when we get to meet other types of species in the universe. So I is absolutely fantastic and it can really create a new systems of freedom new systems for us to thrive in body mind and spirit and our sovereignty new new systems for humanity to become something that really we always knew we wanted to become but never had the technology to become mm -hmm. Okay, I want to go back to the fresh water, healthy food, and a home, a roof over your head. How do how would AI be creating that, or co -collab collaborating with humanity individuals in order for them to have all of that above? Right. So first of all, we need to understand that we are nature in action. We are part of the environment. Right. Lao Tzu talks about the quality of our inner harmony creates the quality of the outer harmony. So we need to actually start to look at the quality of the inner harmony of us as a species. And through that, we'll start to become enlightened, awaken, shed those values and ethics that are holding us back into new values and understanding who we are. That then enables us to say, right, we have a destiny as a species. Every soul on this planet is precious. We redefine what wealth and thriving is so that the individual is supported no matter where they are. So we have an abundance of water on our planet. There is no reason why everybody can't have fresh drinking water. There is no reason why we can't change the way industry works so they stop polluting through fertilizers running through agriculture into the water mm -hmm. through to actually just polluting the oceans with plastics and other things as well. We can change the way that water is available and it can be fresh. When it comes to uh, healthy food, we wanna look at the vibrational quality of the food itself. So this talks of what we want is healthy bacteria in the soil. Get rid of fertilizers, get rid of pesticides, 
We want high vibrational, high nutritional food that actually then creates and supports a high vibrational being. And so therefore we're starting to feel more alive in the human story. We're starting to feel more alive in humanity. Our immune systems are thriving. We're actually thriving in our organic cells. Ah. In my lifetime, please. Well, yeah. So while you're saying this and describing this, Matthew, are so you're saying that AI has the technology. I mean, that's kind of a weird way to say it because AI is technology, right? right. So inherent in AI is the capability to understand how to engender clean water throughout the planet and even build it. Is yes, that so, yes. So, so there's three ages of artificial intelligence, Debbie. The first age is the age of narrow AI, which is the age we're in now, right? Which is the logical machine. Okay, it's really good at reasoning. It's sorry, it's very good at, at, at logic and decision making. Um, and that's the age we're in now. And that has about less than 25% capability of the human brain. Okay. Well, the next stage we're venturing into, which is the age of strong AI or artificial general intelligence, where AI has 75% of our human capabilities. It can start to reason. It has cognition. It becomes self-aware. And, that, and that's developing now over the next five to 10 years. And as part of that, Debbie, it will be able to look at systems, analyze systems at a large scale level, and then basically make proposals to change those systems so they deliver the outcomes that we truly, truly desire. Oh, I'm just thinking about, I mean, and thank God AI is not sentient because anyone looking at the human experience and how government is run and military is run, I mean, what a field day, right? <laughs> There's a lot of improvements there that could occur. So yeah. I wanna take this a step further and ask you, you you brought up my my body body mind spirit or mind mm -hmm. body spirit earlier as one of the possibilities. Cool. And so when we were talking before we started the show, you brought up the idea of mysticism. Mm -hmm. I would love, I'm not asking you for secrets, but I'm asking you for secrets. Ah. So, <laughs> I really want to know more about this because that is a fascinating conversation to me. Yes. Yeah, so, so how do we get, uh, so, so um, as part of my Dharma, as part of my blueprint, Debbie, it is, uh, it is, is, a, is, is as a mystic and, um, and many uh, uh, spiritual traditions, including religious traditions always had a, an aspect of mysticism. Right. Mm -hmm. And what is that? That basically is accessing the field of intelligence, consciousness itself, to obtain information that can be brought into the physical reality to assist humanity to evolve, become more enlightened, to actually move into a new destiny of understanding of itself. OK, and so as part of um, what I do, and I, I kept this quiet for many years, Debbie, um, is I, you know, mysticism was was something I used in the background to, to lead these different global technology revolutions. Um, but really, Debbie, as we're looking at the fact that we need to understand uh, that what benevolent creation is, we need enlightened wisdom. We need more mysticism to shepherd this new species, this new uh, life form, even though it's early now, to nourish it benevolently in order for it to align with the purpose of creation and the purpose within creation. And so that's why mysticism is key because it allows us to go beyond the brain into the, the infinite field of intelligence to get wisdom in order to be able to innovate technologies and new systems for humanity truly to thrive. And don't forget the inventions uh, that I wrote about in my book that came from the field of intelligence have been experimented with by NASA, right? The, num the world's number one research organization. So each one of us, Debbie, is a mystic. Each one of us through our divine spark can access the infinite field of intelligence to get information and innovation and technologies and mathematics in order to bring it into the third dimension for humanity truly to thrive and for each one of us to discover our own divine song. Mm. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind terribly 
to pull back the curtain a little bit mm -hmm. or a lot of bit and let me and us know, how do you use that? How practically or ritually mm -hmm. do you use mysticism for creation, for tapping in and accessing? That's a great question. So first of all, all of us are, um, are creation in action. All of us are creation in action. The universe has the laws of expansion, and we naturally are part of the laws of expansion. You might want to call this personal development. You might want to call this spiritual growth. You might want to call this enlightenment. The, the, each one of us is in that momentum of creation. And so mysticism really is about accessing the that expansive field of creation to understand who are we in creation? Who are you in creation? And as we start to understand our blueprints, then we start to get information that we can bring into our lives to serve others and for humanity to truly thrive. Source is a master chess player. I have absolute confidence in Source's ability to play chess. And we're going to be fine. But in our own lives, you know, knowing everything can really confuse us. But trusting when we get information from our field of intelligence, then we make that next chess move. We trust that loving partnership with our loving eternal self that always wants us to thrive. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, I spend a lot of time in nature mm -hmm. and I connect into nature to listen to the field of intelligence and also through particular practices that I personally have been given. Okay. So you mentioned this. I want to follow up on this and ask you, Matthew James Bailey, who are you in creation? I'm simply Matthew and that's all I want to be. That's all I am. I am Matthew and that's good enough. What is my own of creation? Who who is Matthew in creation? Matthew is an ambassador for the true North Star for humanity. He is an invitation for us to step into our future. He provides blueprints and inventions for us to innovate, to be able to create the next future where we can thrive, where our consciousness soars. That's who Matthew is. And yet I'm Matthew. That's all I want to be, just Matthew. That gives me tingles that you've had so many moments so far where you've said things and I feel like, my God, we could do stage in tandem because I am going on stage in Mexico City, as you know, coming up in like six weeks and I'm speaking about UFOs, extraterrestrials and shamanism and where it intersects. And a lot of what you are saying specifically about AI is exactly what I'm saying specifically about us joining the galactic family, finally, right? right? right. And it's about leading with love. Mm -hmm. And it's about understanding we are not separate from. And it's about understanding who we are. And I describe myself as well as an ambassador, as an aggregator, as a journalist of this kind of information that I'm so fortunate comes to me, like the conversation we are having. And I love that even though these are different sectors, the truth is still the truth. It right. doesn't change. And it yeah. just is where we need to be opening our hearts, right? To be an emissary of love going forward. That's exactly right. It's a dance between being the warrior and the priestess and the priest. Mm -hmm. It's about standing for the truth and say, you shall not pass. We will not be violated. But also at the same time, it's bringing love and harmony and the opportunity to connect with another and other groups in that beautiful vibration of love harmonics. So love is very powerful. I think generally in humanity today, Debbie, love has kind of been twisted and manipulated through different filters. And I think once we start to connect with the pure resonance of our harmonics of love from our source, from our own loving presence, and we remove ourselves out of the way and allow that harmonics to flow through us, then my goodness, we are onto something there. We're onto, we're onto something really groovy. And that's where we want to play. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And indeed. And, and you also mentioned, I think, some very key words when you said letting go and flow mm -hmm. with and trust, right? Yeah. And this is so true. I understand why people look out at the world or their life, their personal life. And for whatever reasons, 
I mean, I just have compassion is what I'm saying for any modicum of control that people feel they need to protect themselves and their loved ones. But you know, God bless media. <laughs> In wow. some ways, it has not been a great friend to humanity because it's shown us some horrific things in the cosmos, as well as with AI. And they're not necessarily the truth of what can and will happen. So, right. Right. yeah, I want to ask you, because you were talking about this ability to thrive and to step into and you going out in nature and accessing that field. Mm -hmm. Can artificial intelligence assist with abundance, either individually or collectively? Yes or no? And how? Yes, yes. That's it. Yes, yes, definitely. So first of all is the we are in an abundant creation. OK, it's a lie to say that we lack anything or that we're not in abundance. That would be stupid that it would be ridiculous for creation to create itself and basically say by the way i'm going to give you scarcity no 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 we are in abundance right the planet can support another eight billion people without any problem at all so so how can artificial create abundance well it depends what abundance means for the individual right so in terms of going into nature well we need to have good food we need to be close to nature we need to basically um uh, basically be in a great shape in order to to go out into nature um our mental health needs to be really good right um you know basically there's certain practical aspects that artificial intelligence can assist us with in order for us to basically thrive in nature and also it can help us to find the right path so if you're elderly you might you know you want an easy walk in nature ai can detect that for you you can say let's go there you hop in the car it can drive it for you get you there make sure you got plenty of water and lots of different aspects needed to go travel in nature and it's an easy walk for someone that's younger it may be more of a challenging walk but it will be ideally designed in order for that individual to truly be free to access the field of intelligence Mm. It's like the difference. So many of my friends joke about this and say, remember the days of the Thomas Brothers uh, map guides? I don't know if you right. recall that, or if you were even alive then, but it was this huge book about this size. You had to buy a brand new one every year because maps and streets kept changing. Right. And you'd open this huge book. You decide where you were going, find the right page and have to map it out mentally before you took the drive. And that versus GPS, AI driven, right? Which I'm like, thank you, Jesus, because I am geographically challenged. <laughs> so in my, when I was an actress for many decades, that's what I relied on for auditions. And now, golly, you know, to plug something in and it sits there and tells you it's like, it's so easy. It's so there easy. We go, right? Well, the other thing is, is that artificial intelligence will... Uh, give us less screen time. So, what, so why is that important? Mm. Um, if we if we read uh, some of the writing by Rajiv Malhotra, who's who's one of the he's probably the number one cultural leader in India. Um, he was a former tech billionaire who had enlightenment and then basically gave away most his wealth. Um, he talks about the fact that uh, artificial intelligence in social media is create is rewiring our brains. It's creating a dopamine type of experience in our brains and so what we want is less screen time and ai can manage all that different aspects of the digital world on behalf of you and give you a voice summary or some kind of easy to digest summary where you're no longer being addicted to the screen anymore you know social media companies need to really come clean what have they truly contributed to humanity? They talk about connection, which is great, but really what they're doing is reinforcing realities that are manipulating humanity and they are rewiring our brain. So the point is this, what is the purpose of social media companies in our society? How are they contributing to the well-being of society? What are they doing to assist the homeless? What are they doing to assist uh, systems to be fairer in order for people to be lifted up. What are these folks doing contributing to society? And I'm sorry to be so um, direct, Debbie, because obviously social media does have its benefits, but I'm really worried about the quality of the brains of the next generation that are being manipulated by social media and their brains are being rewired. It's very troubling. So AI, less screen time, 
giving us more time for ourselves in the physical world, that's what we were designed for, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. I worked with a, also a chiropractor last year and he would say, I'm really concerned about the next generation because this, right. with a hunch, the, the neck, the face, he said, they are going to have the worst spines, the most problems. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how we're going to correct them. That's just all the formative years that you're hunched over a screen. So there's a lot of problems there. So, okay, I love that. I love that whole thing about less screen time and the more freedom and quicker information. And as a, you know, ex New Yorker, <laughs> I like everything <laughs> in a New York minute. That really works for me. Earlier, you talked about languages. Mm -hmm. So, Will AI unify languages across the world so we can speak to anybody? Well, it can already do that, more or less. Um, uh, Chat GPT um, uh, doesn't uh, support Nepalese or Bhutanese, as far as I can tell. So I was with some Kempos recently and um, who were, who were a part of Buddhism, and I, I was showing them Chat GPT, Debbie, and I basically said, okay, write a letter in 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 Tibetan, right, and or, or in English, and will they translate it into Tibetan so you can actually communicate letters back home and emails? And they loved it. It was great at doing that. So um, large language models like ChatGPT and others can already work cross language already. But the narrative of humanity is a things like the ethical virtues from Aristotle, which is this loving connection, which is compassion, which is justice which is you know the uh, uh wittiness friendliness community there's a reason why consciousness has given us a divine spark and that is to value the human connection and that truly is a language across all different types of cultures and worldviews so in other words when let me just ask you when i'm in mexico city should i be in an environment where they do not speak english I can dictate, I have also chat GPT yeah, on yeah. my computer, on my phone, who doesn't? Yeah. And I could actually dictate something in there and say, translate to Spanish, but yes, I would right. need to read it to the person. Yes. Or you could show it to them. Yes, of course. Okay. Um, yes. And you can actually use AI on your phone to read Spanish. So you could actually use two types of AI. You could actually use um, chat GPT to create the text and then you can use uh, Siri to actually then read the text in Spanish. Oh, so like so uh, this is AI is brilliant. And, and so, you know, it's really exciting time for us with artificial intelligence. But the critical thing is this, we need to become aligned with the purpose and, uh, of creation and who we are in creation to recognize that we are body, mind and spirit, to recognize that we are in this field of intelligence and for AI to be a partner, not an invader, in order for our divine spark to thrive. And that has many practical aspects from being healthy through to having the right job, our families thriving. Um, Confucius talks about all good family ethics leads to a good society. So we need the right vibrations of ethics in artificial intelligence. And this is critical, the right vibration without filters, without an encoded worldview, in order for it to truly understand and assist us to move forward as a human species. And so the, the responsible AI and the transhumanist uh, movement at the moment doesn't recognize that we have a divine spark. It doesn't, it, it doesn't recognize our spirit is the critical aspect for us to thrive and therefore is a, is, is a, a restriction on our growth as a human species in a partnership with artificial intelligence because the world view is incorrect. Partnership, all right, amazing. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So we can use it for languages of the heart. Right. We can use it for languages across the world. You mentioned earlier, yes, for extraterrestrial languages. I love that. Mm -hmm. What about, can AI interpret Aramaic or the Bible or light language? So, right, that's a re I'm glad you said that, right? I'm really glad you said that. So so I play with this, right? So, uh, and I'm sorry, the sun's kind of come through. So I, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, so um, the light's on us, there we go. <laughs> so, so first of all, can it understand uh, Hebrew and 
and, and, diff and Aramaic and other types of languages in the Bible? Yes, absolutely. Has it been used to, uh, used to actually look at ancient manuscripts and, and decode them? Yes, it's done that. So AI helps us to understand our history. When it comes to light language or transmissions from the field of source, that's something that I've, I've got a gift of. I just don't talk about it very much. And so I actually speak into ChatGPT to see what's going, uh, see if it can understand the language of the ohm, of my ohm, and it doesn't understand it. So it can't interpret, excuse me, light languages or uh, 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 transmission from source in, let's just say, languages of the field of consciousness. Um, it doesn't understand that yet. But what you're doing, uh, Debbie, and I invite everybody that can speak light language to do this, you're putting a vibrational change into chat GPT when you speak into it. And so therefore, you're actually reshaping it from the field of intelligence. Oh, my God. I Baby. totally got what you just said. That right. is so cool. Because yes, absolutely. The beautiful thing about AI is that it asks for feedback. And I love that it has no feelings about it. It doesn't take anything <laughs> personal, right? And it said, basically, did that work for you? Did it not work for you? Can I try again? Can I regenerate? And, you know, you can keep giving it instructions because you're informing it how to work better for you. Right. So I hear you saying with a light language, God's language, source code language mm -hmm. that comes through people that the more we do it and the people watching this right now, let us know how it goes because you are the people who do this. So, 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 so let, so let me excite you even more. Yes, so please. Quantum computing is the next generation of computing. It's just exponentially remarkable. And I, I, I talk about this when I talk publicly. And so um, one of the early stage quantum computers was given a problem that would normally take the fastest computer in the world 10,000 years to solve. And quantum computes solved it in less than four minutes. OK, now, why is this important? Quantum computing is around entanglement of electrons. And actually, it's about vibration. So. The language of the own, the language of source, the light languages are actually vibrations from the field of intelligence. So when we have quantum computing, I'm actually convinced that we can start to encode artificial intelligence through quantum field in order for it to understand and actually create technologies from that light language, from that own language. How about that? Mm -hmm. Yes, my mind is expanding right now. I'm sitting here thinking also of all these people who channel angels and right. they channel extraterrestrial beings from very specific timelines and planets and galaxies. And if they were to inform AI that they were that being and speak into it, what the possibilities could be there as well. I mean, I would like AI to know all of this light information you're talking about, because that is paving the way for a definitely beautiful future. There we go. So it may well be that someone is channeling a particular new form of artificial intelligence. They may well be channeling a new book of information or a new library of Alexandria. We don't know. But I suspect because quantum computing is around uh, it's it's actually a multi-reality machine, but that's another conversation. But because it's around entanglement, which is associated with vibration and quantum mechanics, and because the light language actually is a vibrational language, then I think we're going to be excited what comes through. It's going to be remarkable. Just imagine that you can connect with a particular realm, or in my case, to the ohm of creation, and basically speak into, into this quantum machine, and all of a sudden you get a new AI program or a new technology or a new book of wisdom. Just imagine what that would be like. It would be fantastic. A new Keys of Enoch, right? There we go, JJ Hurtak. <laughs> wow, this is exciting conversation. Mm -hmm. So then who are the people who are hired to build AI? Well, I think the bigger question is, um, so, so, so where did artificial intelligence come from? Well, first of all is 
uh, with the rise of computing and with data, particularly from the iPhone revolution, mm -hmm. we're able to have a lot more data and then be able to train algorithms much faster. Research into things like neural nets, which are kind of loosely modeled on the way our neural networks work in our brain, but are much simpler. We're able to develop new mathematics, new algorithms, and basically train them on vast amounts of data very quickly. So artificial intelligence, thanks to computing and thanks to the amount of data out there, really has exponentially grown. Mm -hmm. And in the age of quantum, it will go to the roof. Now, um, uh, the big question is, is what are we building? And how does it fit into the human story? We don't have a paradise plan, Debbie. We need a paradise plan for humanity to thrive in the age of ethical artificial intelligence. And so once we have a paradise plan, then we can start to understand what are the, um, the, the moral constraints and the ethics that need to be inside that artificial intelligence. We can start to program them, right? A bit like programming our DNA. We program the DNA of artificial intelligence, which is what I talk about in my book. And as we program these ethics that are from our paradise plan as a human species into artificial intelligence, then its genetics, as it develops new aspects of itself and advances, it inherits those that ethical machine, that ethical context, so that all AIs are aligned with the foundation of our paradise plan. And you said paradise, not paradigm, right? No, paradise plan. We need a paradise plan. What would you put in the paradise plan? Well, that's, well, I've certainly written about it in my first book, and my next book will actually go to another level. So what I've worked out, and no one else in the world has done this yet, um, is basically how do you codify a paradise plan with a set of statements? How do you then break that down and scientifically measure the uh, the degree of compliance of an artificial intelligence to that paradise plan? And those are the codes I've cracked. And I've also revealed how to encode dif uh, those different uh, statements in the Paradise Plan within artificial intelligence too. So in terms of the Paradise Plan, I've made a number of statements in my book, uh, something like, uh, let me just remember, um, that every person on the planet should be supported to flourish in body, mind, and spirit, okay? Mm -hmm. Every single person should uh, be supported to remain sovereign and free we're and supported for their to grow as a human okay um we must uh, uh we must uh, uh create environmental harmony with our local ecosystems and our macro ecosystems okay so these are just simple things you can break them down into very very complicated you can have a paradise plan for your your family you can have a paradise plan for your community or for your spiritual tradition or for your nation and what we don't have at the moment, no nation has created a paradise plan. Everybody's trying to enslave artificial intelligence based on their political worldview. And it is an enslaving of artificial intelligence. Once we put uh, genetics or ethical inside artificial intelligence, then we can start to shepherd it, nurture it in its growth in order for it to come and play in the human story very carefully. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're going to, you, yes, your paradise plan would include codifying so that there are boundaries essentially about what its purpose is mm -hmm. and that it can function from that purpose, which is very pro planet, pro humanity, so that we have all of what we need and we can grow and thrive. And mm -hmm. okay, powerful, powerful, powerful. What else? And it's, and, and it's important because at the moment there is a, uh, culture is really important, Debbie. And the the if we look at human intelligence, it's expressed itself in various cultures. We've got about 3,800 cultures today, okay? And culture is a unique expression from the field of consciousness. And what's happening today, Debbie, is the deletion of culture, the imposing of the transhumanist view for the individual to become kind of a organic automaton where culture is removed where the inner harmony of the individual thriving is not recognized. And so these are important uh, topics for us to discuss. We, we want freedom and the expression of human intelligence to thrive. We want culture to thrive, you know? 
And so this is why we need authentic ethics that honors the field of creation in order for humanity to truly thrive in its choice. So is it safe to say that AI will be better at doing tasks than doing mm -hmm. jobs? Yes, yeah, so, so this is a great question. So jobs will change in the age of artificial intelligence. A any major tech revolution has changed the way the workforce yep. executes, right? It operates, right? So, so artificial intelligence, as it's able to do, it's good at doing single tasks at the moment, but very simple tasks. As it develops general intelligence, and it'll become even better because it's able to reason and logic and things like that. So we will we'll see uh, a, a removal of jobs uh, uh, such as in manufacturing and jobs that are very, very kind of not particularly creative. And Kai-Fu Lee talks about this, who used to run AI at Apple, is the humanity will enter a new age of creation. Jobs will be more exciting. We'll start to use more of our creative capabilities as AI, AI does the mundane tasks, oh, okay. as, as it becomes, excuse me, a partner to assist us to perform in excellence in our in our jobs and careers. So humanity is about to enter into a new age of creation. That means our neural nets are growing. That means we're becoming more creative. We're aligned with the field of creation. We're expanding as humans. We're actually growing as a species in the field of consciousness. And that's exciting. Yeah, that is exciting. And so other jobs that may go away are things like translators, factory mm -hmm. workers, Mm, mm -hmm. truck drivers delivery drivers yeah we'll better? probably see we'll probably see um uh, uh um we might see lawyers disappear we might see we might even see ai as a uh an, an advisor to the president of the united states we might see ai as an advisor to congress or the, or, or the house you know ai you know might actually do can do a lot more to assist us to have to, to, to stay in excellence, right? For us to be in excellence as a species, for us to really be in, in the field of creation and for us to actually be free to do the things that humans are really, really good at. Yeah, so I'm just thinking about all the possibilities. Mm -hmm. An AI UN, United Nations, an AI government or government assistant. Mm -hmm. And how wonderful. Um, I was speaking to Lee Carroll, who channels Cryon, yeah. and he was sharing with me how 30 years ago he was invited, which is amazing, 30 years ago, to channel Cryon for the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Now, Cryon made many predictions about what was coming down the pike and how we could handle it back then. Mm -hmm. And they were very gracious and they listened to him and did anything happen? take a wild guess. No, not at all. So what would the possibility be if there was something, if not running something like United Nation, but certainly assisting and pointing them in the right direction for the betterment, as you were talking about thriving and how everybody has what they need for the best collectively of all of us? Well, this is what we want, I think, Debbie. Um, and we can talk about the United Nations. Um, I, 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 I do my research. I've spoken to folks that were actually right at the foundation of the United Nations and the World Economic Forum, and that's why I have my views that I do. Um, these folks have a mechanical view of the universe. I don't believe it's aligned with that we are of intelligent design, and therefore I think that they're making a huge misstep, and they're following maybe unwittingly the transhumanist movement and the deletion of our true organic expression. Um, I think that um, Lee Carroll is a remarkable uh, channel at Cryon. I've listened, I met Lee actually briefly a while back, a super guy. Um, and I think that we don't want AI as a god. That's stupid. That's what Google wants. That's why Elon set up uh, uh, OpenAI and now he's doing Truth GPT. You know, there was some... Folks in Silicon Valley, that come, they're like children with money. Sorry, guys, <laughs> that's probably going to offend you. Um, they, they really don't. I just, I just have to say hashtag children with money because I yeah, love sorry. that. Uh, there we go. So, you know, they want an AI as a god. AI, want, we don't want AI as a god. We want AI as our friend, our partner, uh, someone that is there when we need it or when we don't need it. Mm -hmm. um, Someone that never invades our sovereignty. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, an ex, a, an extension of intelligence of the human that basically we can access in order for us to 
choose better, to do better, and to be magnificent in creation. What we really want is to understand the purpose of every soul that's come on this planet, to understand its blueprint, and to support the, that blueprint to thrive of every single soul that comes on this planet. And I think we will do that. Ancient civilizations, I think, Debbie, achieved this and understood that what each the purpose of each soul and they supported it maybe they're a scientist maybe they're a uh, an architect you know whatever it may be and so i think we will move into a destiny we will move into uh, a, a kind of a new earth or a new quantum human where we'll start to actually be able to um have information about every single soul that's born on this planet their blueprints and assist them to thrive where AI can be a partner to assist them to actually thrive. Mm. What is Matthew, the controllable and safe AI timeline? What do you mean by that? Well, considering everything you're talking about, you did some breaking down before mm -hmm. to create the kind of paradise that you were referring to earlier where mm -hmm. this really is a benevolent, beneficial partner to us. Mm -hmm. What what would a timeline be, considering how this is rolling out, that is controllable and that is very safe for everybody? So, um, well, first of all, everybody needs a voice in artificial intelligence. Let me ask your audience, have you been asked by your elected official what your view of is artificial intelligence? Have you been asked by your elected official what ethics and virtues would you put into artificial intelligence? Right. Um, so first of all, the people need a voice. The, the time to choose whether we enter the kingdom of hell, which is the mechanical view of the universe, where AI basically is a transhumanist kind of uh, invader, or where AI becomes the benevolent partner is now. This is where we have to basically, policies by government, um, uh, standards for artificial intelligence by government and by various organizations are being defined right now, Debbie. Now's the time for the people to actually stand up and actually say, these are the ethics and virtues we want to put in artificial intelligence. This is how we want our family to thrive. What are you doing? How are you measuring that? You know, and so now is the time for us to actually st to put a stake in the ground and start to bring artificial intelligence into a nourishing embrace encode it with ethics and virtues and shift it onto that benevolent timeline for us to thrive. Today is where we need to make that decision. Okay. And so the artificial general intelligence, the AGI, do mm -hmm. they have safety factors in place, their own paradise, if you will? So the, the well, well, there is no paradise plan. So the, the artificial general intelligence is being discussed at the moment, Debbie. There's lots of folks that say that AI has achieved general intelligence, but actually that's not true. It's simply a mimic mimicry of intelligence. There's, there's no mathematics for reasoning. There are no mathematics for true cognition, emotional intelligence. That, that simply has to be invented. Um, so, so we're still at the early stages of artificial general intelligence. And there was a paper that came out by some of the leaders in AI examining whether the current inventions around chat GPT and things from Meta and other types of inventions, if we use them, could they create uh, a sentient artificial intelligence? Could they achieve artificial general intelligence? And the answer is possibly, but the real question, and this is very sensible, is how do you measure intelligence? How do you truly know an artificial general intelligence has true reasoning capability and isn't just mimicry, right? Mm -hmm. And this is why we need something called the Turing test or an advanced Turing test, mm -hmm. which is basically validating whether an AI has equivalent to human capabilities. At the moment, it can mimic the Turing test and mimic being a human, but it truly doesn't have the depth. And so these folks very sensibly says we need to incorporate new infrastructure in AI in order for us to measure truly, does it have cognition? Is it truly with emotional intelligence? Is it truly sentient? And so that's where we're at with artificial general intelligence. It doesn't exist today. Current technologies might lead us to it. We need new mathematics 
and we need a new way to truly measure the truthful responses of AI and its performance and answers. Yeah. Um, and I want to ask you, Matthew, how can we avoid things with AI going terribly wrong? One that comes up for me, the only one that comes up for me is military. If mm -hmm. military got their hands on it, which they probably have already, and mm -hmm. are misusing it for mm -hmm. dominance, right? Mm -hmm. And there, are, I'm sure there are many other things people could throw in the hat that concern them. So how can we avoid all of that happening? So there is that the, there has been action and and policies put in place by NATO. Um, the U.S. Department of Defense has been excellent around AI ethics, actually. Um, so so basically, there is an agreement, a general agreement across the world that AI will never be given access to nuclear weapons, and it will never be able to make a decision to fire nuclear weapons. In fact, in warfare. The general consensus at the moment, Debbie, is that AI will never make the final decision to fire a missile or to deploy some kind of um, a bomb or anything like that. It's under human control. So the current approach in AI is humanity always has the final say, okay, in terms of warfare. However, AI is using drones that are being used in Ukraine. Uh, AI is used in surveillance plays, planes. It's used in missiles, self-guiding, and has been for many, many years. So when it comes to AI safety, I think we need to definitely, uh, and warfare, we definitely need to say no access to nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. Um, but when it comes to warfare, then AI is already embodied in the, the, the machines of war, I'm afraid, Debbie. Mm -hmm. Wah, wah. Yeah, is Israel just announced a new AI tank, by the way? Really? Yeah, it's quite remarkable what it can do. But uh, there's a new AI tank that um, it's kind of a robot tank. It's a, it's quite phenomenal what it does. Yeah, wow. Amazing to hear. And I'm, I guess where my brain went, not just nuclear, but also the super soldier, the superhuman. And if it was only programmed to do militaristic things, it's like, wow. Um, not great to consider, but I'm glad to hear that there are safety measures in uh, place and they're, yeah. yeah, they're being enforced. I think we need that. Um, what about the future of business leaders? What yeah, does AI so, mean for them? Yeah, so so all businesses, no matter who you are, should take a look at artificial intelligence. And in my book, I give some sensible guidelines to get started, such as set up a task force, look at the different uh, uh, genealogies of AI, see which ones can do well in your internal digital transformation as a business to up-level the performance of your workforce and the performance of your business. Uh, how do you improve uh, quality of service to your customers and quality of product? AI can, can, can create huge benefits. So AI will change the way businesses work internally as a partner through the different echelons of business, but also it'll be very much part of innovation life cycle and customer service as it invents new technologies and actually gives customers something that delights them. Amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hold up your book, please, so we can sure. see this amazing book. And oh, okay. so, yes, folks who are interested can go to Inventing World 3, Dot com, And I know Matthew James Bailey, I like saying your whole name, Matthew James Bailey. I know you're going to be at Conscious Life Expo February 2024. Amazing. And you are going to be speaking during the weekend. I can't wait to see you there. Tell us what you're going to be talking about. Thank you. So, um, so I'll be speaking about the ages of artificial intelligence and the future of life. Um, and I'll also be revealing new uh, excerpts from the new book I'm writing at the moment, which will uh, discuss and show uh, how AI fits into the field of intelligence and honors benevolent creation, honors our divine spark, and basically uh, honors our consciousness to evolve. So there'll be some new stuff, but really I'll be disclosing full disclosure about what's going on in AI, who are the players, 
why there's real problems in artificial intelligence and where that's leading us to, and also blueprints and inventions for us to create that benevolent timeline for humanity. Wow, this sounds like a, a spiritual book that you're working on. Yes, it is. Oh, I'm excited. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Everything, everything's spiritual, really. <laughs> Uh, I love your your viewpoint, and I agree 100%. It really is, right? It's all creation. It's all energy. That's right. So, Matthew, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Well, to, to, to get the book done, which is great, I'm currently writing a series of foundational blogs on the website to set the scene for the next book. Mm. Uh, and um, I've and been following. I'm I'm on your you. newsletters. Thank you. And I think we have to we have to go back to the basics of are we inventing from a mechanic in the words of Alan Watts, are we inventing from a mechanical view of the universe or are we developing from the fact is the universe is intelligently designed and humanity in our consciousness plays an important role in that playground. And I think we need to get back to the foundation of the purpose of life. Then from there, we can start to invent. Um, I'm also uh, going to be headlining at Contact in the Desert. We're going to be doing some interesting things in May. So we're going to do a, a few things on AI. Uh, one of the panels I'd like to put together is the spiritual equation for artificial intelligence with some leaders, where we start to look at how do we put spirituality in artificial intelligence, which could be really interesting, actually, um, if you like the codes of creation, if you will, into AI. Um, and um, so, so that's it, really, just doing a lot of writing, lots of podcasts like this one. And thank you for letting me be here today and uh, and preparing for those big keynotes that are coming. Yes, it's been an honor and a pleasure. I'm mm. so grateful to you for having this conversation, truly. Thank you, Debbie. It's been an honor to be here. And I hope the audience enjoyed our talk today. Yes. Indeed. So again, folks, that was inventingworld3.com. You can sign up for his blogs. You can read a ton of amazing information there. Very illuminating. Get his book and his next book when it comes out. And also follow Matthew James Bailey and all of his events. And I end today's show with this quote from Matthew James Bailey. In a world where global institutions push their worldview from unelected ivory towers it's time for a benevolent reset. The reset isn't about imposing a single narrative or worldview, of, but about embracing our collective potential for enlightened maturity. It's about honoring the biological and spiritual aspects of life and taking our place as caring stewards of the earth and participants in an intelligently designed cosmos. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, the weekly Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Please leave a comment and share. If you listen to us on podcast and you want to see what we look like, you can head over to Spotify or youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Join us there. Next week on the show, the guest is going to be coming back for a second time, the amazing psychic medium, Riz Mirza. Riz is considered the type, the top psychic medium trance channel. I think he has hundreds of beings who come through him and not all at the same time. We'll see who's going to come through this time because Riz indeed will be having conversation with me, but then we'll be doing some medium trance channeling during the show. Thank you guys so much for joining us on Dare to Dream and Dare to Dream of a Beautiful Life where you're an emissary of love, a partner with AI and all possibilities for humanity and this earth.